So, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to introduce the, the first lecture of the second day of the winter school. Um, and it's, um, it's the philosopher's turn now. So, I'm, I'm glad to introduce uh, Professor Paul Heunigen Hune from the uh, from the Leibniz University of Hanover and University of Zurich. He's been mainly working in the field of uh, philosophy of science, but also in uh, ethics of science. Um, in uh, the early 90s, when I was a graduate student, um, I happened to read uh, his book on Thomas Kuhnt, Reconstructing uh, Scientific Evolutions, Thomas Thomas Kuhn's Philosophy of Science. It was a unique uh, book uh, then in the 90s um, because even, even though Kuhn was famous uh, already then and, and had been famous for decades, there weren't any proper uh, studies of his work. So um, Paul Heinigen Hoeneß was the first thorough and in a way a revolutionary account of Kuhn's uh, philosophy. Uh, he proposed a neo-Kantian reconstruction of, of Kuhn's philosophy, um, which strongly opposes uh, irras irrationalist um, interpretations of, of Kuhn's work. Uh, his recent book on systematicity is a I would say uh, revolutionary, or at least radical in, in a way too, as it concerns humanities and social sciences uh, in the context of philosophy of science. This is not uh, a common practice. It's, it's a rather new trend in, in philosophy of science. Uh, in the field of ethics, uh, Paul Heuning and Hune has primarily dealt with the questions of resp responsibility, which is also a very important and relatively new topic, I would say. Um, Professor Heuning and Hune has visited Estonia on several occasions. Um, at least twice he has been the keynote speaker at Estonian annual uh, philosophy conferences but he also has attended other, uh, other academic uh, meetings, and his works have been translated into uh, Estonian, so you could see uh, his paper on systematicity in uh, journal Academia, for example. But uh, to uh, um, come to the, uh, today's topic, um, I'd I'd like to give the floor to Professor Paul Heuningen Hune. So, yeah. Welcome. And uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> uh, there is handout available. If you haven't got it yet, uh, there is uh, nice job up, up there with the handouts. <laughs> okay, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Adla, for this uh, very kind um, introduction. I hope uh, you all enjoyed yesterday's reception as much as I did, and I hope you are as fresh as I am now uh, in order to follow my uh, presentation. I do have much material, but um, you don't know that from the program. Uh, the directorium granted me two full hours just for my talk. Um, um, Okay, you're not awake. This was a joke. Okay, fine. So I need 45 or 50 minutes, and I'm going to talk about the human sciences between quantification and hermeneutics, and I'm just telling you now the structure of the talk. I will first talk um, or give you a clarification, because the terms quantitative and qualitative, they seem to be quite simple, but they're very often used in a very confusing way, and one has to clear that before one gets a clear view on what is really going on with that contrast. The second thing will be then I will very quickly introduce systematicity theory in the seminar this afternoon. I'll do, uh, we will do that uh, in more detail with respect to the social scientists and the humanities. Then I will ask the question, why quantification? Why is it that scientists, especially in the natural sciences, but also in the social sciences, are so keen to quantify? What's so marvelous about quantification? Why are they doing that? <clears throat> then I'll talk about hermeneutics, which will be, for some of you at least, 
uh, more uh, common ground, but I will do it in a somewhat different way than uh, the usual one. Um, then I come and apply hermeneutics, uh, which is also not the normal way of understanding it, um, to the explanation of action, and then I'll have a summary at the end. So you see from this structure with the summary at the end, this is a very traditional talk with a summary at the end and not in between somewhere. Okay, so I start with that clarification between, uh, for, uh, between quantitative versus qualitative, and this is very often seen, both in philosophy and in the uh, sciences and the humanities, um, that is seen um, as a different in subject matter, namely that there are qualitative properties and there are quantitative properties. This is the common understanding how people, or most people, understand this contrast. <clears throat> And this contrast, then, of different kinds of properties is then associated with a different uh, difference of types of disciplines, namely those disciplines uh, that look at the quantitative properties. This is, of course, natural science. Um, and the qualitative properties are probably mostly the province of the human sciences. So we have a distinction between these groups of disciplines by a distinction between kinds of properties. This is uh, the common view, I guess. And um, from the point of view, then, of the traditional humanities, quantification in the human sciences is a category mistake. And this is then called scientism, right? And scientism is something very, very, very bad, right? If you come from a humanities, you know that, right? And scientists then think, what is the matter with these humanists? What's bad about that? Anyway, so from the point of view of the natural sciences, the point is that quantification is a necessary feature of scientificity. So very often natural scientists have the feeling because the humanities do not quantify, they are not really scientists, they are not really respectable uh, uh, academic disciplines, and they're just blah, blah uh, areas you know, where everyone can say anything, and then people are very happy, and after uh, the, the discussion, they drink wine together, or beer, for that matter. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, scientificity means here especially the solidity of knowledge claims. So many, many natural scientists have that feeling that solid knowledge, namely scientific knowledge, is necessarily quantitative knowledge. And everything that doesn't fulfill that standard is just not science, it's just lousy, it's just poetry. Okay. Um, and then the uh, non-quantifying humanities are then not scientific in a derogatory sense. I mean, they're just the useless disciplines. This is the stereotype of many natural scientists. If you haven't known that and you, you are in the human sciences, uh, this may be a surprise for you, uh, but this is the real world. This is, um, you've got to, got to uh, confront that. All right, so I think this is uh, all very misleading, uh, this standard view. Uh, because the difference between qualitative and quantitative is firstly a difference of kinds of description. It's not something of the properties themselves. It's our way of describing things. It's imposed by us on a certain uh, subject matter. And I'll give you a simple, simple example. If you look at the external thermal conditions, compare then a qualitative description like biting cold, very cold, moderate, mild, uh, warm, hot, extremely hot, etc., and you can also state the, uh, uh, as what I say so complicated, uh, exterior thermal condition, you can state it in degrees Celsius, right? By saying tonight, today, it's, I think, minus eight degrees of Celsius. So it's our choice how we describe these uh, external thermal conditions, uh, and we can do it quantitatively, and we can also do it qualitatively, and we can also uh, do it comparatively. It's also very often overlooked by people. There are three modes of description, quantitative, uh, uh, comparative, and uh, qualitative. Comparative meaning yesterday it was even colder than today. All right. So uh, different properties um, present themselves as differently amenable to quantification. So in some cases, it's easy. Uh, for instance, um, it's easy, for instance, concerning length, weight. Concerning duration, it's already critical. I mean, duration is duration really measured in hours when we mean the term we use in everyday life, the duration of something? Well, sometimes an hour is very long, sometimes an hour is very short. Uh, so it's already critical. Velocity is clear. Intelligence, I mean, there are numbers attached to intelligence. Do they really measure what intelligence is? Quality of life, they also indexes for, for quality of life, quantitative indexes. Do they really get at quality of life? Difficult to say. Okay, so difficult, so these were the possible simple ones, but here's the difficult, perhaps impossible one. How about quantifying love? Do you love uh, your children more than your whatever, lover? 
or husband or boyfriend or can you can you give degrees there? How about creativity? Can you measure give numbers to creativity, to beauty, or to spirit? So um, these are now we are of course uh, in the area where the humanities, of course, uh, discuss. And there it seems to be that the, the properties that are discussed here, well, only a few examples here, that um, they, they really are somehow resistant to quantification in some sense. You don't know why, but this seems to be the prima facie um, uh, evidence here. <clears throat> now, the question, therefore, must be, should one aim at quantitative descriptions in the human sciences? Is that a good goal or is it a bad goal? Is it just uh, idiotic and just scientism, you know, projecting natural sciences methodology on the humanities in a completely improper way? Or is that something one should aim at? So this is a question and one should ask the question. So what are the disadvantages of using quantification? Should the human sciences rather stay with qualitative description because too many disadvantages of quantitative description? Now, in the following, I will discuss this question in the context of a specific general philosophy of science called systematicity theory, because systematicity theory gives you resources to evaluate uh, the advantages and disadvantages of certain procedures. This is the idea. Therefore, if I embed this question into the larger context of systematicity theory, we may find arguments why quantification is a good thing or why quantification may be a bad thing in the humanities without just without thinking, you know, as a reflex like a Pavlov dog saying, no, no, quantification is very bad in the humanities. No, wait a minute, we think about it, okay. So, systematicity theory, whoops, that's the same what I said, offers a general framework in which academic disciplines can be represented in the way these disciplines see themselves. It's a very anti-imperialist um, enterprise. I cannot go into too many details, uh, but this is the idea that um, it's um, the inner logic, if one wants to say, put it that way, the inner logic of a uh, particular science or discipline is represented in systematicity theory without imposing anything from outside. It's just a completely anti-imperialistic theory, and that's very different from the other philo general philosophy of science that we've seen so far. They are all imperialistic, mostly physics imperialistic. <clears throat> okay, this is the book in which that is... Uh, um, published, <coughs> we talk about it in the afternoon. So I give you only the very, very, very roughest outline without any argument really why this is a good theory. Uh, the main question that is asked in systematicity theory is what distinguishes scientific knowledge from other forms of knowledge, particularly from everyday knowledge? This is a different way from asking the question as it has been asked in the past, where the main contrast introduced by Popper mainly, the main contrast to scientific knowledge uh, was uh, pseudoscience and metaphysics. And then Popper asked, what's the difference between pseudoscience, metaphysics, and science? And I'm asking a different question. I'm not asking this question. I'm asking the question later. Once you have good answer to this one, then you can also answer the other one. But it's going to be very complicated. Uh, the question here is, what is the contrast between our everyday ways of knowing and scientific knowledge? So just to give you an example, um, you, uh, those of you who have not seen me, you all formed, um, as social psychology informs us, within the first 30 seconds when I started talking, you all formed a picture of me. You all got an idea who is that Paul Heunigen, right? You got a certain idea. You did that in a completely unsystematic way. You don't know what you did, but after 30 seconds, you had a feeling, oh, this is, he's such and such, such a, such a guy. So if you compare that, if I was uh, trying to become president um, of this university, it may be that the board of directors sends me to an assessment center, right? And then I have to undergo two, two days, 12 hours psychological tests, scientific psychological tests. And then they find out, pointing is such and such a guy, he is absolutely not capable of leading this university. So thank you very much for coming, uh, Professor Heuning, and goodbye. So you see there, when you compare that, what's happening in the assessment center, in comparison to what you do in the everyday practice, obviously what they do in the assessment center is much more systematic. Right? This is an, on an abstract level describing what's happening there. They have a, a, a sequence of tests. They know exactly what tests they to do wh when, because there is empirical evidence that uh, tests influence each other, and so on and so forth. And they have all uh, considered that, hopefully at least. Uh, so it's much more systematic, and that's the basic idea. So scientific procedures are much more systematic than our everyday procedures. And as I said, it's not Popper's question about the demarcation from pseudoscience and metaphysics. And we've got to eliminate this question. 
Popper's question from your mind when you try to understand systematicity theory, because those of us who have been longer in philosophy of science, we've been infected by that question. It's very difficult to get rid of it. <clears throat> So the answer then is that scientific knowledge is distinguished from other kinds of knowledge, from everyday knowledge in particular, by a higher degree of systematicity. And it's important to see that it's uh, with respect to the same subject matter. So knowing someone, for instance, is the subject matter. And then we have everyday practices, and we have scientific practices. And uh, further, systematicity theory is, first of all, a descriptive theory. So this is very different, again, from the tradition until Kuhn, where philosophy of science was seen uh, by the proponents um, as a normative discipline, telling people what's rational or reasonable to do uh, in science. So this is a different uh, sort of enterprise here. And um, it's becoming a little complicated now because um, this is not just one thesis, namely science is more systematic, but the thesis can be unfolded in nine different dimensions. So there are nine theses in that theory that have to be defended, namely that, uh, system, that science is more systematic regarding certain activities, if you wish, or properties, namely descriptions, explanations, predictions, the defense of knowledge claims, critical discourse, epistemic connectedness, ideal of completeness, generation of knowledge, and the representation of knowledge. I won't go through these now in all details. I'm just telling you what it means is that scientific predictions are more systematic than everyday predictions. Scientific explanations are more systematic than uh, uh, everyday explanation, and so on. And uh, epistemic connectedness, you don't understand here. It's fine. Um, we may talk in the afternoon about it. So that is the idea. In these nine dimensions, science is more systematic than everyday knowledge. Um, perhaps I should say that uh, the third one here, uh, predictions, doesn't apply to all uh, disciplines. So for instance, you probably think, think enough the humanities, but if you want to have a better example, take mathematics. Mathematics makes no predictions whatsoever, ever. And it's absolutely clear, because time is not a part of mathematics, okay. <clears throat> in any serious sense, at least. Then it's physics. Uh, the progress of science then, but that's a longer argument, can then be described or represented as an increase of its overall systematicity. And this is what I'm using now. As you see that systematicity distinguishes the scientific knowledge from the, um, from the everyday knowledge, systematicity can increase, and that seems to be a good thing because then you know, it, it becomes more and more orderly and, and uh, thought through and um, well, better predictions and better explanations and so on. Uh, so this is the measure that you increase the systematicity in the progress of science, and then we have a measure to, to judge something, namely, for instance, are, is quantification something good or is it something bad? And the question then transforms into it, does it increase science's systematicity? OK. Uh, one has to be aware of the following thing, and this is part of this non-imperialistic strategy. Due to the flexibility of the concept of systematicity, there is conceptual space for the differences between the sciences. So when I speak about the systematicity of descriptions, it's not the same when I refer to botany or when I refer to theoretical particle physics. It means very, very different things, although the word is the same. So this is a flexible concept, and the systematicity descriptions. Oh, yeah, I have here uh, two uh, fields of history. Economic history. In economic history, you have typically uh, macro data, uh, macroeconomic data. They are quantitative. They are aggregated. You are interested uh, in them. And in the history of mentalities, for instance, much nearer, although it's all history, uh, much nearer, of course, uh, with the uh, humanistic disciplines, uh, it's the question of accurate description of states of consciousness, whatever that is precisely. Uh, for instance, in the conceptualization of childhood or the conceptualization of sexuality, because that is really different in different cultures. And if you uh, want to describe in one particular culture the history of these mentalities, you have somehow to describe that and become better and better and more precise precise uh, by doing various things. And you see, although these are both uh, sub-disciplines of history, the concepts of systematicity already when applied to descriptions varies between these two different sub-disciplines. So this is absolutely non-imperialistic. So I'm just saying, if you're interested in the history of mentalities, then you have developed systematic descriptions that fit your subject matter, namely, what is a mentality? And then you have to find descriptive categories doing that. And you, of course, do that then in a more sophisticated, more systematic way than when your grandparents tell you something about the change of mentalities in the, in the last, whatever, 50 years. All right. 
So the pertinent concept of systematicity varies with the nine dimensions. All the dimensions have different concepts of systematicity with the dis uh, disciplines and subdisciplines. And then the whole thing is also time dependent because uh, disciplines develop and with them even the uh, uh, concept of uh, systematicity develops. So this is a very complicated thing and uh, just to give you an, a quantitative idea, um, there are something between 200 and 600 scientific disciplines and if you look at the dis sub-disciplines, uh, the order of magnitude is 10,000. Nobody knows anything more precise. Nobody in the world. There is no catalog, uh, canonic catalog, but there are many, many different ways and you end up always with the same 200 between 200 and 600 disciplines. Uh, and something like 10,000, perhaps it's 12,000, perhaps 15,000. Nobody knows how to count them precisely, the subfields um, in, uh, 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 in our academic universe. So uh, nobody has uh, any sort of clear view of the whole uh, universe of the sciences. Now let's get uh, finally, after these preliminaries, to the question of why quantification, what's so marvelous about quantification, or what's so ugly about quantification. And uh, the thesis that I'm defending now is, first of all, uh, successful quantification increases systematicity. That's very simple. And I'm going to demonstrate that, and then we'll see later whether that's a good way of increasing systematicity in the human sciences. That's an open question, because again, it may be good increasing systematicity in some disciplines, but it may be detrimental to other disciplines, and one has to discuss that, not uh, just relying on your prejudices. What you learned in school and from your academic teachers. Okay, so it serves systematic quantification, serves scientific progress. Now the point is, it's got to be successful quantification, right? And the pre question is, what is exactly successful quantification? That is really where the, the main question is. And roughly, one can say the following, and this is of course well known in sociology, social psychology, and all these quantitative um, uh, uh, social science disciplines, they say roughly the quantified variable must be measurable. You must have measuring instruments, measuring ideas, how to measure them. The measurement must be reproducible. That's called reliability in the social sciences. And they must measure what one wants to measure. That's called validity. So these are the three conditions, abstractly wonderful, doing it in practice, uh, difficult thing, thing. So for instance, does IQ really measure what you think intelligence is? Validity, well, difficult to say. I don't know it. <clears throat> so for instance, you may ask the question, what exactly does the impact factor of journals measure? I mean, people use that impact factor, say, well, you know, I published a paper in that journal and it has a very high impact factor, 20.3 uh, or something. This is the impact factor, I think, of science and of nature. Uh, wonderful. And then the question is, what does that really mean? I mean, is, does that mean that this is a fantastic paper that you wrote? I don't know. Perhaps it does. Or if you take the H index, uh, who has never, uh, no, I got it the other way. Who, has, who knows what the H index is? Okay, yes, we are in humanistic circles. Uh, if you go to the natural scientists, everyone knows what the H index is. I don't give you the abstract definition. Someone, a person, has an H index of 10 when she or he has 10 publications that are at least 10 times cited. Right? So if you have an H index of 23, you've published 23 papers or books that have been cited at least 23 times, each of them. Right? So there are scientists who have an H index of 150, have published 150 papers, 150 times cited. But as I saw, because I checked people here on Google Scholar, very few of um, uh, people in the uh, human sciences really use Google Scholar in order to check whether they're child cited, what their H index is, and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, you may do that or you may leave it. So the question then is, or the remark that I'm making here, what are the exact conditions for successful quantifications? I would love to know that. I have no idea really how that is. I can only say these three conditions have to be um, uh, fulfilled, but what the preconditions are, that these conditions about validity, measurability, and, uh, uh, via, and uh, um, what was the other one? Reliability, validity, and, and measurability, uh, what the conditions are that, that uh, make it possible that these three things uh, apply, I don't know. I simply don't know. I know examples where it works. I gave you examples where it's quite obvious that it works, and there are other cases where it doesn't work. And I think in the social sciences, it's very open in many cases whether the quantifications that are proposed are good quantifications. I mean, some of them are really bogus, I think. They're just bullshit. Uh, but I'm not telling you which one I think here. 
Uh, but uh, it's, it's a very difficult thing because you can bluff your way you know, into quantification and then you say, I'm a scientist, wow, a social scientist. Uh, and then what you're doing is probably just nonsense. <clears throat> The function of successful quantification for scientific knowledge is, and I give you six uh, different uh, things now, I think it is six, in which you see that um, this function is really something that is connected with the increase of systematicity, and therefore it's something, once you can do it, once you can successfully quantify it, you are very happy as a scientist because you're really improving your science. So, First, there is an increase of systematicity in individual description. Individual description meaning description of individual things or processes or something like that. Example temperature, I mentioned it already. Our qualitative descriptions, there are perhaps 20 or 30 uh, every day expressing expressions ranging from absolutely bitterly cold to intolerably hot or whatever in all the languages. But you know, this is not very orderly. It's uh, absolutely bitterly cold, that very different from extremely cold. Which one is colder? Well, intolerably hot is certainly hotter than extremely cold. But there are things in between. You find 20 or 30 expressions in the languages. Estonian will have more expressions, I guess, for coldness. and differentiates more carefully between cold days and probably doesn't have so many uh, words when it's 50 or 50 degrees uh, or so, um, which you need in Dubai, for instance. So um, we have this qualitative description. Now compare that with a quantitative description with a simple thermometer. And you can buy it um, in the supermarket for something like 3 euro. And it ranges from minus 20 to plus 30 or something. And then uh, 10 uh, degrees. And you have 500, 500 very clear descriptions of temperature. Right? They are well ordered. You have enormous systematicity by the quantification. And this is, of course, attractive. You have a much, much richer vocabulary by just using these numbers and then saying, today it's minus 8.1 degrees, instead of saying, oh, today it's really bitterly cold. OK, so it's more precise than qualitative descriptions instead of very warm 28 degrees. Uh, and the increased range uh, of expression in a simple thermometer, 500 possibilities. Well, this was an example I guess I took from Germany and not from Estonia, therefore minus 15 to plus 35. All right. And it's an unequal ordering of all possibilities, which you do not have in uh, our qualitative language. Uh, so it's really an, an impressive systematicity increase uh, due to quantification in the description. So whenever you are able to quantitatively describe something, well, a certain property, then you have gained much systematicity. Presuppose successful quantification, not bogus quantification, right? It's very important. Therefore, it's so attractive to bluff with quantification in the social sciences. The second thing is um, the possibility of quantitative regularities or laws of quantitative generalized descriptions. This is attractive for the natural sciences, the engineering sciences, parts of the social sciences, much less in the humanities. Uh, but you must know that this systematicity increase due to quantification exists. So for instance, take Weber's law of psychophysics, so it's at least psychology. Uh, ds uh, over s uh, is a constant k. s is the stimulus magnitude. Delta s is the minimal difference between distinguishable stimuli. It's one of the very few laws in really in psychology that seems to work. Um, and uh, th the important thing is for psychology that Weber's law generalizes over different intensities and different sense modalities. It just systematizes a large amount of data. So very different sense modalities are captured by this law. And then you understand that uh, the human organism, and possibly also other organisms, function according to this law. So you get a very generalized description of a certain range of phenomena that apply to this uh, organism. And that's, of course, very interesting. And therefore, this generalized uh, description, or quantitative generalized description, is very useful for psychophysics. Um, another one is, um, which is probably not uh, very close to your heart, the chemical revolution at the end of the 18th century um, it was fundamentally triggered by quantitative measurements of the weight of reaction partners. Because uh, before, in this qualitative phlogiston theory area of chemistry, people, it was just not part of the tradition to make quantitative measurements, especially of the, the partners in a reaction. And when people started doing that toward the end um, of, the nine, of the 18th century, then trouble arose. And that led to this uh, um, revolution in chemistry. Modern chemistry depended on the quantification. Otherwise, it would not have been possible. <clears throat> 
Then, well, you don't care about chemistry, that's fine, unless you eat something, but uh, you are a chemical organism as well, so um, you should possibly care a little. <clears throat> then, the next thing is um, you can better test hypotheses. Um, Popper would call that higher degree of falsifiability, and I give you here a very nice example when I stumbled upon it when I read a book um, on the history of geology. The genesis of mountains on the Earth's surface was a question that was in modern times discussed from the 17th century. Why are there mountains on the Earth? Why? What, 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 what produced this, these mountains? And um, the plausible qualitative hypothesis in the mid-19th century was that is the effect of the contraction of the Earth due to cooling. So the Earth's surface looks like an old apple. You know, it contracts. People knew that from mining, that you know, if you go down in, in the Earth, it becomes warmer and warmer. And then you know, this, uh, this uh, warmth um, somehow disappears then. And that means uh, the Earth is probably shrinking. Uh, and uh, therefore. So that sounded like a wonderful theory. You say, oh, that's the reason. You know, the Earth is cooling. Oh, yes, and then we get these ripples, uh, these other mountains. Now, the point is with what looks qualitatively very convincing in a way that you say, yes, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful theory. That's probably right, because we know the cooling does take place, so we have an explanation for the mountains. The point is when people started quantitatively calculating what the effect of this cooling of the Earth is. And whatever you did, the maximum mountain height due to cooling of the Earth is 300 meters. Whatever mechanism you propose for the cooling, it doesn't work. You only get mountains maximum of 300 meters high. So what you realize by the quantification, that theory is damn false. Right? Although it sounds so plausible when you look at it qualitatively. So what you get by the quantification, successful quantification, one has to say, you get a test of the hypothesis. And in this particular case, the hypothesis fails. <clears throat> so uh, then people understood at the end of the 19th century, uh, 18th, 1870s, we don't know why there are mountains. So we have no idea. And we've got to now under try to understand why there are mountains. It's pseudo knowledge. It's not knowledge when we believe that we understand why there are mountains mountains on this Earth, which is a very interesting question. I mean, why are there mountains? OK. So the falsification of the hypothesis is only possible when quantitatively articulated in this particular case. I mean, not in every other case. But this is one case. So it's one of the advantages some, that sometimes there that quantification leads to a degree, higher degree of falsifiability. And it helps you eliminate false hypotheses. <clears throat> The next thing is positive confirmation of theories, not only this negative stuff. And the example is here the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. Uh, well, this is a story. I'm not going into it because uh, I see that out of my two hours, I already left, uh, lost one, half an hour one. And uh, it was very important there that a precise measurement led then to the acceptance of general relativity theory. Again, a theory which you love um, since you were born almost. Um, but uh, this is a very important uh, case here for the natural sciences. And then the next thing is uh, quantitative data allowed the use of mathematical methods for diverse purposes. Now, you may say, oh, that's not all so interesting for the humanities. Uh, well, um, if, you, um, if you are ever sick or have someone who is sick and uh, he or she has to take medicine, it's very, very likely that this medicine has been tested by RCTs, that is random, randomized uh, controlled trials. They are a quantitative measure in order to find out whether a certain medicine, roughly speaking, works or does not work. You need statistics. It's absolutely essential. All the cancer treatments you get uh, today, apart from surgery, all the chemical treatments, are based on uh, randomized controlled trials. Otherwise, you cannot find out whether a certain substance is uh, helpful uh, for medical purposes or is not. It's absolutely essential. And, and we all, uh, uh, part of us at least, survive on that because we get the right medicine. And finally, uh, some quantifications are absolutely essential for the humanities, and you should be aware of it. It's absolutely essential, namely age determination. Dating is absolutely essential for the humanities. For all historical science is fundamental, namely for the identification of potential causal relations. If you don't know which event was when, you have no chance to discover which is the cause of the other one, right? Because the cause must be earlier. And so if you have something in the Middle Ages, you say something, an event in 1530, and you're interested in the causes, and you cannot date the events around that, those from, uh, 15, uh, from 29 and 31, you have no chance to discover. Because you've got to identify those things that are causally relevant. Uh, they've got to be earlier. That means that proposes dating. So dating is absolutely essential. I mean, it's taken for granted by us. And it's quantitative, right? It's numbers. It's real numbers. 
Uh, okay. So that proposes a lot of things. It proposes a calendar system that's stable somehow over the different uh, time scales, whatever is involved. It involves a time measurement, and it uh, involves a variety of dating techniques, because uh, when we date uh, certain remains that are 500 years old, we have to have techniques. They are all natural science techniques, by the way, almost all of them unless you use hermeneutics and then you use grammar and something like that, and then you can say this uh, document must be from them and there. Uh, that's, uh, the, the, but uh, most of the stuff is really uh, physical. For many historical science, for instance, climate data and other dated natural events are absolutely essential. People were long pondering why uh, the year 1830 uh, all over the world was a year without summer. And a year without summer, had, that had many, many social consequences, extremely important consequences, uh, co many co concerning political issues, many, many things. The point was, and only 100 years later people discovered that, there was a big volcano eruption, and that volcano eruption really uh, um, influenced the atmosphere, so there was uh, really very, very little sunshine, and uh, then uh, the, uh, the harvesting was very bad, and so on and so forth. That had immediate consequences for, human, uh, for humans, and of course, if you are, want to understand what happened in certain societies in 1830 and 1831, and you are not aware of that fact, you won't get it right. It's absolutely essential that you get these causal factors right. Not only what people thought, but really this material stuff whether they couldn't earn anything or could get, uh, couldn't harvest anything because of the weather condition. That's purely you know, natural science, nothing else. So the natural science providing these data are fundamentally quantitative. They only do their job because they're quantitative. So in, in various ways, uh, the um, humanities depend on the quantification um, due to the natural science, so you should not look down, because if you say, I don't want to have anything to do with the natural sciences, then you are lost of, uh, uh, of uh, dating, um, and if you can't date anything, you are lost in the humanities. You can think whatever you want. <clears throat> okay, so the result is this. Quantification provides an increase in systematicity in various dimensions, descriptions, explanations, predictions, defense of knowledge claims, and the representation of knowledge. Um, uh, and therefore, uh, quantification may lead to scientific progress and is therefore so attractive in the natural and social sciences. And for the humanities, I uh, don't think this is so attractive. Okay. However, the presupposition is that the quantification is successful, especially with respect to validity, and that's the main problem in the social sciences, the question of the validity of any quantification, because you may go badly astray and um, make uh, lots of nonsense. <clears throat> okay. The fundamental question in our context, therefore, is it possible to successfully quantify those features of human beings in which the humanities are interested? Does that work or does it not work? That's the question one has to discuss now. And uh, there is a program in the humanities, and that's apparently fundamentally opposed to quantification, and that's called hermeneutics. And um, I take hermeneutics in a, in a wider sense, <clears throat> and I'm going to explain what I mean here. It involves an element that is supposedly characteristic of the humanities, and therefore absent in the natural sciences, understanding, or with the German original from the 19th century, verstehen. Uh, this concept is a technical term. That's very important. The, concept, the relevant concept of verstehen or understanding is a technical term different from our everyday and scientific concept of understanding. It's a technical term, and many, many discussions go astray because people do not uh, take care. Many social scientists, however, are quite skeptical about hermeneutics and understanding as a method because they say, no, 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 we've got to be a quantitative empirical science, right? And understanding all that stuff, oh, my God, understanding appears to be totally subjective, a kind of psychological empathy without effective empirical control. So many social scientists say, no, 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 come on, this is 19th century, forget uh, Verstehen, this is not scientific, you know, it's uncontrollable, it's psychological, so I'm not interested in, in this sort of Verstehen. And I shall first discuss hermeneutics, and then I will relate it to the explanation of action, and that will be at then at about 12.30 or so. All right. Now, in my understanding of hermeneutics, the subject matter of hermeneutic enterprise comprises, I give you just a number of examples, actions, cultural products like text, pictures, traffic signs, paintings, sculptures, toms, movies, theater plays, poems, symphonies, dances, rituals, gestures, institutions, roles, buildings, archaeological remains, machines, and other artifacts, etc. So it's a lot of very heterogeneous uh, things. And um, what is sometimes this is described as that these things have a special relation to human life. 
Well, that's almost empty because you don't know what sort of relation it is. A special relation different from, for example, an anonymous stone on the bottom of a lake. And I will call these things here, this is my term that I'm introducing you there, I call them cultural products. And you see already in the first line there, uh, I say cultural products like texts um, and, and the other things. So the paradigm for cultural products is texts. And I will develop my idea of hermeneutics, uh, which is not original, um, um, with texts. So cultural products in the given sense are not necessarily artifacts. That's very important. Uh, for instance, a holy mountain or a religiously interpreted solar eclipse apparently purely natural science stuff, they are also cultural products because that holiness of the mountain is, of course, a very special relation to human life. <clears throat> Abstractly speaking, cultural products have meaning. <clears throat> now, this may not be extremely helpful uh, because uh, meaning seems to be a very problematic concept. It's not observable, it's not measurable, and it seems to be hopelessly fuzzy. But my claim is um, I think it can be comparatively made, made clear, comparatively clear, when applied, for instance, to short texts. So if you read the sentence, talent is the capital of Estonia, this may be a disappointment for those from Tartu who believe that Tartu is the capital, but sorry, no, it's Tallinn. But to understand that, to get the meaning, to grasp the meaning of this sentence is very uncomplicated once you understand English, and once you know what a capital is, what Estonia is, and the Tallinn is the name of a, of a certain city, then it is very clear what it means to get the meaning of that sentence. So there it is quite clear what the meaning is, although to say what it is is a different story. But it's quite clear that to say, to read this and understand that means grasping the meaning of that sentence. And cultural products in general have meaning because either they are texts or they are text analogues. And there are text analogs in the sense that you can, in a sense, read them like a text. So to understand a cultural product means to grasp its meaning. It must be read, either literally, if it's a text, or metaphorically, if it's a text analog. All right? So this reading or reading and understanding of texts in that sense has nothing to do with empathy. Right? It's nothing psychological. It's not psychological to understand what it means to say Tallinn is the capital of Estonia. It's nothing to do with psychology. It's semantics, right? It is meaning in the sense of uh, semantics. It has nothing to do with uh, empathy. Neither has reading or understanding of other cultural projects, including actions, anything to do with uh, psychological empathy. It's a different ballpark. It's the different ballpark of semantics and not that of psychological empathy. It's a different thing. And now, you may have the objection, especially when you come from the empirical social sciences, that the concept of meaning that is used here is used here ambiguously. The meaning of a sentence is not the same thing as the meaning of a whole book or the meaning of an institution, uh, for instance, shaking hands as an institution in the sense of the sociologists, or the meaning of a building, of a machine, or part of a machine, of an action, etc. You may say, well, you know, meaning? Well, this is, uh, this is completely fuzzy. I don't think so. This is not an objection. It's correct. It's a very heterogeneous things, but that's not an objection. Um, on the one hand, there is an abstract concept of meaning, and on the other hand, there are different concretizations of that concept of meaning compared with the concept of fruit. I mean, apples are very different from oranges and bananas, but still there is an abstract concept of fruit, and then if, if you go down to, to, to the concrete things, they're very different from each other. That's the same with meaning. Meaning is very different when you look at the meaning of an action, or the meaning of a text, or the meaning of an institution, or the meaning of a piece of art. I mean, uh, it's very different, but still Still, it makes sense to have an abstract concept of meaning. In order to understand the abstract concept, one has to be familiar with some of the concrete examples. In the same way as you have to understand the word fruit, you have to know some, some fruits. Otherwise, you don't understand what the sort of abstraction we are dealing with. Okay? Grasping the meaning of a complex thing is often an alignment of the hypothetical meaning of their parts and the hypothetical meaning of the whole. This may happen at different hierarchical levels. You understand have a complex thing, and then there is meaning in the, in the parts of it, and then you have somehow a, a find an equilibrium between a different uh, hypotheses. So for instance, you have a long book, and there are words and sentences, paragraphs, chapters, and the whole book, and you have to understand both the, the units, the smaller units and the bigger units, and that must somehow all cohere in a 
in a, in a good sense. And that is called this sort of equilibrium that you need has been misleading referred to as the hermeneutic circle. It's a very simple thing. It's just because you have a thing that has many different parts, and then all the meanings of the parts must cohere somehow in the, in the meaning of the whole thing. We are completely familiar with that uh, in everyday life. So if you look, for instance, at irritating advertising texts, this is a technique of advertising text. They irritate you, say, hey, what are they saying? Uh, or irritating behaviors, and then you try to make sense of them by finding uh, little parts, and you, you interpret them, and then you interpret other parts, and then you look how they cohere, and then you handle yourself uh, to the meaning. So it's nothing uh, very, very strange. The understanding of the humanities proceeds similarly, only more circumspect more reflexive, more aware of alternative, et cetera, in one word, more systematic. So hermeneutic is something, and, and um, although I'm not a, a, a pure lover of Heidegger, but Heidegger has seen here something quite correctly, that this, and we are human beings, we are beings that constantly try to understand in this technical sense. Right? This is correct. So I think uh, I sw uh, explanation of action is a wonderful example, because uh, explanation of action is an understanding of the meaning of action. I go quickly through it. Uh, it's an, an application of hermeneutics to actions, understanding of actions to grasp their meaning. Uh, that's, of course, relevant in everyday life, psychology, cultural anthropology, sociology, history, politics, law, everywhere. Um, and uh, we don't need empirical generalizations. So uh, we usually uh, use a volitional element uh, and the intention and a cognitive element, his or her belief of the actual situation. And then, um, for instance, at the end of the lecture, Syria gets up. Do we have a Syria here? I picked an uh, Estonian name. No, sorry. OK. Gets up and moves in the direction of the bus station. Why? Because she wants to get home, and she believes that uh, she has to use the bus that stops at the station. And then you understand why Syria gets up and moves to the station. This is it. So um, the explanation uh, refers to the intention and pertinent beliefs of the actor, not to the neuronal or muscular, uh, muscular realization of the actor. We are not interested in natural science when we try to understand actions, because we want to understand actions <coughs> on the basis of intentions of the actor and of his or her beliefs in the situation. This is understanding, and that will remain so for quite some time to come. <coughs> Uh, so uh, a reading of the action with respect to its meaning, and that means to read the action in terms of the relevant intention and beliefs of the actor. OK, uh, this is really analogous to reading of texts. So it's, it's the same sort of thing. The meaning is somehow in. It, it's a very bad metaphor. It's not the meaning is not in the action, as the meaning of the text is not in the text in any a spatial sense of in, but somehow we may speak so without understanding what we're saying. But anyway, this is uh, the same thing. Uh, the same pattern, by the way, also holds for action explanations referring to unconscious motives. It's exactly the same hermeneutic stuff. It's just um, that the actor doesn't know about the intentions. Uh, so what you do in psychoanalysis, you, you do the same sort of uh, hermeneutics. Um, and uh, in, uh, well, I have an example here is why did President Truman uh, drop the bomb over uh, Japan? And there's a long discussion in the historical sciences. There are dozens of books on that. And it's a very interesting thing. And it's always the question, what did he want and what did he believe? Uh, and the standard story is probably not true. Um, OK, um, I'm not going through these uh, details here. And uh, all right. So the, again, the, the, the story is the difference between everyday actions, explanation, and those by the human sciences is human sciences are much more careful in the ascription of intentions and beliefs. Because you cannot observe the intentions and the beliefs. It's very difficult to ascribe them. And you know all prejudices, uh, say racial prejudices, whatever, it's always ascriptions of certain things which we cannot observe. And therefore, they're always hypothetical. And and very risky, and people make many mistakes. And therefore, the humanities have to be especially careful, the human sciences, uh, to be more precise. Uh, it's a critical reading of many sorts of documents, inclusion of context, indirect evidence, alternative explanations, and so on and so forth, all the properties that good historical sciences have. It's absolutely essential. Otherwise, you do not understand the action of the uh, actors. Actors and the human sciences are just much more systematic without referring to quantitative data. Right? So here's the conclusion. 
uh, first of all, in the successful cases, quantification contributes to scientific progress in an undubitable positive way. You have to know that as a humanist. You must not be afraid of quantification. Quantification is a good thing where it works, where it is successful. Don't look down at the natural sciences because they uh, love numbers so much. It's very reasonable that they do so. In the human sciences, there are many cases of successful quantification, but also many highly controversial cases. And the controversy exists for good reasons. As I said, it's not so easy to have good quantifications, successful quantification. Therefore, this uh, controversy is a very, it's a sign of health of the humanities. But it should be discussed. You shouldn't have an, a reflex and say, no, quantification has nothing to do with the meaning of life and human beings. That's nonsense. When it comes to action explanation in the human sciences, intentions and belief come into play for which persuasive quantifications do so far not exist. It's absolutely clear when we come to action explanation, all the stuff that's relevant here, namely the intentions and the beliefs, there are no quantitative measures for that. And uh, therefore, the action explanation in all the realm of the social science and humanities, they are essentially, at the moment at least, and for the next decades, essentially non-quantitative. And they're hermeneutic, this, which is the contrasting program. In general, the, in the human sciences, the hermeneutic dimension uh, involving the multifaceted concept of meaning seems indispensable. And that is the point. Human life is fundamentally articulated in terms of meaning. Uh, meaning in this, you know, meaning of institution, of gestures, of buildings, of uh, whatnot. Um, and the human sciences dealing with that meaning are in that respect non-quantitative and not quanti quantifiable. That's very important if one understands what the hermeneutic dimension of these disciplines is. All that, by the way, could change in the far future, in the far future. So we're talking about 10,000 years or something. Uh, if the current psychology should be seen as uh, pure folk psychology, as some philosophers uh, do, and be replaced by a neuroscience, by scientific psychology, because uh, these uh, uh, neurophilosophers say that, that the term uh, intention, for instance, uh, or belief are just everyday notions, and a scientific psychology would get rid of these terms and then have uh, quantitative terms. But this is so far away that every one of you who gets tenure um, will, during that time as tenure, not realize uh, that this is happening. So don't worry about that. This is just philosophers thinking, uh, OK. In the foreseeable future, the human sciences will have to live with the tension between scientifically desirable quantification and their own fundamental concepts that deeply resist quantification. This is just a fact of life. And the human sciences should uh, accept that and defend themselves uh, as uh, disciplines of that sort. Thank you very much. OK, seven minutes. <clears throat> Thank you for this most inspiring talk. We have about 20 minutes for uh, discussion. And if you allow me to ask the first question, as a former chemist, but still not an imperialist about uh, science, I'd like to ask what, what, what do you think about the idea of reconciling uh, the uh, natural sciences and human sciences uh, from the other end, in the sense that uh, paying more attention to the qualitative dimension in the, in the sciences, like physics and chemistry, because there is such a dimension. Yeah, um, and uh, referring to chemistry, uh, the chemistry uh, up to the, the 19th century was a qualitative chemistry. And the chemists there were interested in, uh, they said, these are the qu qualitative changes of matter that we are describing. The physicists don't describe these qualitative changes. So when something is, uh, is uh, heated, and then it changes color, or you make a, a compound, and then it changes properties, uh, these were all qualitative changes. And also the similarities between metals, for instance, uh, the qualitative similarities between metal, that they are shiny and that they are flexible and so on, they were the main uh, target of explanation in chemistry. Um, and the idea, uh, the German word is Stoff, um, uh, translated as substance, which is misleading, uh, of chemistry was fundamentally as such a qualitative thing. Whether the uh, modern now sciences uh, today, whether they should bring up qualitative uh, properties again um, uh, I don't know. It depends. It may be that in certain, uh, I don't think in chemistry, seriously speaking, uh, at least not in anagonic chemistry or anything physical chemistry. Uh, but if we go to ecology, it may be that certain, certain, in certain areas, a qualitative understanding, even beauty, may be heuristically useful. 
The problem simply is, is uh, the, the low degree of falsifiability. That's the problem. And therefore, scientists, you know, they are afraid that this is purely hypothetical, speculative, so it's not scientific anymore. So it's nothing. One cannot say anything against qualitative properties. They're wonderful. They're perfect. The only thing is, if you handle them and you want to handle them scientifically by articulating hypotheses then, for instance, singular hypotheses or general hypotheses, and you want to test them, then you are in much more trouble than with a successful, successful quantified uh, concept. So uh, open-minded scientists are, of course, open-minded. If you have a new uh, realm of phenomena and they, you have no idea how to deal with that, that you start with qualitative descriptions of what is going on there. And then you think, well, is it useful or, or feasible to quantify this concept in order then to get to generalizations? Or is it not possible? And, and how shall we proceed? So uh, there may be a certain narrow-mindedness by certain scientists. I mean, especially in physics, uh, those people who deal with math uh, all day long, they think the only only science uh, is a mathematics, mathematics science, but that's just nonsense. I mean, it's just false. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah. So, um, mics and. Yes, uh, thank you for the interesting talk. I'd like to ask about this um, claim you make, made on, on slide eight when you said that the progress of science can be described in, in an increase of its overall systematicity. Yeah. And the way I understand you, systematicity essentially describes how we do science rather than the knowledge that we have about the world. So the more systematic we are, the more kind of more exact knowledge that we can gain about the world. But systematicity itself doesn't really describe the knowledge that we have about the world. So it seems to me that you're, just, you're saying that scientific knowledge, sorry, scientific progress comes in the form of how we advance methodologically, not in, in terms of how we gain new knowledge. No, if I, I can illustrate what I mean here. Um, I mean, I, I didn't explain that well because I don't have enough time because all this aggregation process over a systematicity is quite complicated. I just wanted to say it as a thesis, I didn't argue for it. The point is, if you look, for instance, at uh, classification. Classification is something extremely important across the board. So if you go to linguistics, for instance, uh, the, the catalog of languages uh, uh, comes out every five years, and then uh, 200 languages increase or decrease for whatever reasons. So classification of languages, and also uh, if you look at chemistry or biology, classification is of utmost importance. Uh, just uh, uh, probably you don't know, uh, chemistry now knows something like 140 million compounds. Right, that are described, and they must be classified. There must be a nomenclature, and so on and so forth. So the point, point is, if you look at biology, for instance, we talk uh, of uh, species, number of species, order of magnitude is 10 million or something. Right? So the point is that if you, if, if you compare that with uh, our everyday classification, say, of animals, what we do, and we compare that with the respective biologists do, then it's the knowledge itself that's much more systematic. It's not the procedure. So systematicity applies when you look very carefully at the nine different dimensions. It is something that may describe procedures, but it may also describe the result of the procedures. Right? So it's both cases. And in both cases, when your procedures become more systematic in whatever sense exactly, or when your knowledge becomes more systematic in whatever sense, um, then this is progress in the sciences. But one has to argue for that. It's, I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying this is um, the result or it's the claim in systematicity theory. So uh, your question was, what's the meaning? What does it mean to say right? uh, that systematicity increases? And you see it immediately uh, when you look at the, the increase uh, of the knowledge that is gained. Right? It's more, for instance, more precise or it's better defended. So the fourth dimension, defense of knowledge claims, when you have developed, say, new empirical techniques, say, in the uh, natural sciences, uh, how to defend a certain knowledge claim, and you can measure it more carefully and more precise, and then you have progress um, uh, regarding that because of an increase in systematicity. Did I answer your question? No. OK. Come to the seminar, right? Thank you again for, for your talk. Um, my question concerns the idea of explanations, specifically uh, under the explanation title, the, uh, the debate of contrastive explanations or uh, explanations seeking questions that are contrastive in the form of why is it the case that P rather than Q. Yeah, right. And it seems like the, the, the literature on that 
uh, doesn't really uh, go through the distinction between these everyday explanations and scientific explanations. That's right. So there, there seems to be some sort of par parallelism between them. And do you see this contrastive idea as an indicator in, in the systematicity and overall uh, a possible distinction between scientific knowledge and everyday knowledge? I simply don't know. I hadn't looked in, in the, in this, into this case. Uh, what, what I wanted in the book, I wanted to have some main types of explanation and look whether they are more systematic in the sciences than they are in everyday life. And I did not go really into the theory of explanation because that wasn't my job. But it may pos possibly be useful to look at this discussion about contrastive uh, explanations from the point of view of systematicity theory. It may be useful. I, I, I have no idea, but it may be useful. And I, I, I don't know what the result is. Uh, perhaps you can try that, but uh, I have no idea what the result is. So there was a lady up there. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting lecture. And as a humanist, I, I really welcome uh, this kind of exploration of the different modes of knowing and inquiry. Uh, and I'm convinced that um, quantification has a place uh, in, in what we do in human sciences, obviously, and, and for humanities as well. Um, I wonder if I could ask you uh, just about, um, I know you worked on Thomas Kuhn, and being in comparative literature, one of the concepts that Comparatus I know just loved to take up was that of incommensurability. Um, and I'm relative... going to talk about it tomorrow in the seminar. Okay, well, <laughs> I wish I could, could be there for that. Uh, but I, I wonder whether um, you seem to imply that systems can be uh, plural, Different disciplines have different systems. Uh, I wonder whether you would say that systems can be contingent, so that a particular cognitive frame, for example, might be um, appropriate in one culture and not appropriate in uh, application to even similar phenomena in another culture. Well, this is a little, um, your question is a little ambiguous, I think. Um, of course, different cultures have different what one calls knowledge systems. So um, I was involved um, in a big conference many years ago from the UNESCO uh, where the, the difference between, it was the World Conference on Science, and the question was uh, what is um, the relationship first descriptively between tra so-called uh, traditional knowledge, you know, especially Africa, black Africa, traditional knowledge, say their classification of plants, for instance, plants that are pharmacologically relevant, and then compare that with the Western scientific things. Uh, that, that there are different, if one wants to say, thought systems, yes, of course, of course. I mean, this is, I mean, every cultural anthropologist knows that, that people really think differently somehow in different cultures. The question is, now, this is just something where systematicity theory has nothing to say. Uh, in a different context, I would say I use that in my classes. I told you about it yesterday when I had classes, especially with the students from the third world, and I tried to understand, to, to uh, explicate to them what incommensurability is in the history of science. Then I used examples, healing techniques and healing ideas that are used in traditional knowledge, say in Africa, and compare that to, to the Western uh, scientific outlook. So this is wonderful, but I don't see how you want me to relate that to systematicity. I, I guess my question is, if systematicity uh, it, it assumes that an increase in the system is always a positive and good thing, is it? Because if that system is something you're trying to impose... Yeah, uh, I see your point. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm not saying it's an increase of system. Syst I'm speaking about systematicity. Now, the word systematicity took me years to discover that. You can derive the word systematicity either from the noun system, or you can derive it from the adjective systematic. And I discovered that I have in mind the derivation of systematicity as the noun deriving from being systematic. But being systematic is not the same as being a system. 
And then I discovered, by the way, that another philosopher, the only philosopher within the last 100 years who also de dealt with uh, systematicity, Nicholas Rescher, he used systematicity deriving from the term system. And therefore, when I read his stuff, I didn't know what was going on until I discovered, whoops, there is an ambiguity in the term systematicity. So um, it's not an increase of, of systems, as I said. So the main point, I think what you are aiming at, perhaps what you're aiming at, is um, that making things more a system, it may still be idiotic because it's no contact with reality, for instance. This is why dimension four is inbuilt here, the defense of knowledge claims. And I'm saying in the book that this is the most important one. So everything that is systematic, but not really, def uh, it's got to have knowledge claims, right? It's got something that has knowledge claims. It has the claim to be knowledge or being true or whatever then, uh, or confirmed or whatever it is. And that claim must be defended successfully. Right? So as soon as you have systems, say, uh, like uh, Glasperlenspiel, uh, Hermann Hesse, or something like that, you know, people building complicated systems, that has nothing to do with uh, science. Because uh, the uh, confrontation with empirical data in the empirical cases, or proofs in mathematics, or whatever it is, uh, is missing. So the defense of knowledge claim is absolutely essential. And uh, this is, of course, something where the uh, traditional cultures, traditional knowledge, uh, both um, uh, our Western uh, uh, earlier traditional knowledge and also in other cultures, they don't have this sort of culture that is uh, put to the extreme in science that you defend knowledge claims, right? It's the explicit defense of knowledge claims. It's something that is, for the culture of science, absolutely essential. It is not essential in a culture that works. You don't have to defend your knowledge claims about your ecology when you know where the best fishes are. You just go there and fish and don't talk about it, how good you know that, right? Nobody's interested. So defending of knowledge claims is not something that's essential for every culture in every respect. It's in particular situations important, so in times of changes when you establish something new. And of course, in science, it's an essential part because it's the, the, the enterprise that tries to generate knowledge and an essential component of generating knowledge is the defense of the knowledge claims. Thanks. I did not understand. I did not really answer your question. I know it, but we can talk about it. <coughs> uh, thank you for the lecture. Now, I would like to ask the more or less general question about um, uh, the distinction between qualitative and quantitative data and humanities. Uh, since we have um, the new kind of um, shift in um, uh, digital, like digital uh, sphere and digital humanities, so my question would be how you see the future of uh, humanities when we suppose or think that uh, everything like qualitative, da qualitative data can be uh, made quantitative in terms of uh, like process of the digitization, digitalization and whatever. For example, if we are thinking about uh, some historical maps or I do not know, literature texts, that they could be like um, um, made from the qualitative, like change their qualitative sense to a quantitative one if we are transferring them to the digital space. So. Yeah. Well, I think um, that these new techniques, as far as I know it, I, I just um, uh, heard a lecture by uh, one of the leading uh, figures in digital humanities from Stanford University, and my impression was, this is wonderful. This is absolutely marvelous because what you can do now, you can uh, analyze large bodies of texts that you could not analyze in their entirety. And you can do something now which you couldn't do before. So this is wonderful because it broadens the horizon. The question is whether the traditional forms of humanities are strongly affected by it, and I don't see that. Because even if you get something, say, they say you, you, what you weren't aware of, a certain meaning shift or the shifts of emphasis. So you look at uh, 5,000 novels in a certain uh, time, uh, in, in 100 years, and then you see, oh, that's interesting. We hadn't seen this. There's a very delicate change you know, in, in emphasis or vocabulary, uh, themes, uh, and so on. And this is indicative of some things. So this is very useful, very but still, if you want to find that then in detail in a certain novel, you've got to read the novel and analyze the model in the very traditional sense. And then, I mean, when, when I wrote, wrote my book uh, on Kuhn, this was in the late 80s, 
um, well, in the, I started in the early 80s, and uh, the first uh, desktop uh, computer was 81, and then I had my first computer in 84, but I could only use it during, instead of a typewriter. And um, I'm a perfectionist in, in some of the things I'm doing uh, in philosophy, so when I spoke about incommensurability in Kuhn, I wanted to have every single line in which incommensurability occurred, and I had to do that by hand, you know. I had long lists that when I read all these texts, so I read all the texts of Kuhn, of course, my God, would it be wonderful to have that all on the computer. You just press uh, uh, Control F, incommensurability, and then you get the 50 things, and I got my insights only by really comparing all of them. So I think the golden, the golden age of the humanities uh, is now approaching. Because we have absolute control and search, we can search all the texts and masses of text. This is is only an auxiliary instrument. It, you've got to read it. So when I got, then, then I had these 50, you know, 50 sentences of context about incommensurability, and then I tried to understand by reading them, and then, of course, with a, a, as subtle as possible interpretation of what's going on and putting it into context, and the very traditional stuff that we've learned from the second half of the 19th century, from the philologies developing in Germany, then the context of the humanities uh, and the historical social sciences. But the point is we get additional instruments, and I think these instruments are wonderful. So humanism and I did have uh, discussions with humanists who said, oh, you know, these computers, you know, for me it's most important that I have this poem and then I read it and try to understand what's going on. Yes, wonderful, but use these additional resources. They are invaluable. We have chances to, to, in our humanistic, purely humanistic enterprises to use these big data things. They will not lead us very far, but they may lead to completely unexpected insights. Subtle developments of 100 years was something where you may see the beginning and you may see the end, and then you say, what is exactly happening then? And then you just digitalize uh, 15,000 novels, and then you may trace that somehow. So um, I think it's wonderful. I mean, every instrument which increases uh, possibilities of doing science, I welcome. So it's wonderful to have that. One should just put it in the proper proportion to the other stuff. And as I said, the concept of meaning is fundamental for the social sciences and for the humanities, and that won't go away. So everything that helps us grasping meaning in whatever form it is, say, in whatever discipline in the humanities or social sciences, whatever helps us grasping this very deep, well, fine and subtle and complicated and hard to falsify and blah, 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 all that stuff, everything that helps is welcome. Thank you a lot. Yeah, thank you. So uh, there was a question here in the fifth um, thank you. This was especially relevant to linguists because there is a major quantificational um, turn taking place in linguistics. There's major text corpora becoming available and people are using statistical analysis more and more. And, um, I, I, one thing that happens with this turn, uh, it seems to me, is that people perceive there to be a conflict between a sort of a quali qualitative approach and a quantitative approach. They, they perceive a sort of a conflict between yeah. theoretical versus data-based yeah. approaches. And my question is, do, do you think that's real? Because it seems to me that, um, well, even in a very sort of hard quantitatively driven research, the last step, you know, the step after data collection and the step after finding, oh, well, you know, two variables have the significant link between them, the last step sh is always going to be, why would we care? Why, what right. does this tell us? And yeah. this step is inherently always qualitative yes. in a sense, or we can call it theoretical, we can call it, you know, yeah. hermeneutical, <laughs> yeah. whatever. Yeah. But yeah. W how do you perceive this conflict? I mean, it's not obviously the only, um, research field this yeah. happens in? Well, I'm not going to answer this question because I have not investigated the case. And I'm not a philosopher who speaks about things uh, where he doesn't really investigate the case. So I don't know that in detail. Uh, I want to talk to linguists for two hours from both camps and read some of the, the main articles there, and then I may form an opinion. But even without knowing anything, what I see in the sciences, in many sciences, um, we are primates, right? We are, human beings are primates, and primates um, have a very strong sense of in-group and out-group, and uh, the turf you are on it, and my sense is that very often in the sciences and humanities, as in the natural sciences, you know, there are just fights 
uh, uh, about turf, you know, this is mine, this is yours, no, this is mine, this is not yours, and blah, blah. So this component is in there. But I cannot judge whether that really uh, uh, um, uh, unclarifies the situation in linguistics. From what I know, and this is much too, much too little, my sense is, as I tried to explain in the, in the answer to the question before, there is no competition. And if there is competition, it can only be useful competition. Because um, uh, unless you exaggerate your claims, right? If you exaggerate the claim and you say, oh, you know, this qualitative linguistics, what a nonsense. Now, finally, we, are, uh, we don't read text anymore. No, no, of course not. Uh, uh, we, we only uh, quantify a certain uh, 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 corpora of text. Then you're possibly missing your, you're missing your subject, possibly. But again, uh, I'm not, I have no idea, because I have not looked closely into the subject matter. There, where, where I have looked um, into such conflict, say, the way I tried uh, to, to analyze uh, the, the uh, understanding and explanation controversy, it's much misunderstanding, much, much thinking in terms of uh, your turf, uh, the other turf, and, of course, not understanding, really understanding the other side. So there are very few, if you look, say, for physicists, I mean, they have no idea about hermeneutics. And there are so many people who know something about hermeneutics and have no idea how quantitative natural sciences function. So it's just uh, ignorance, just ignorance. I cannot judge it, as I said. So there are many factors that play, uh, can play there. But I, I, in principle, I wouldn't see how could a conflict arise here, seriously, because uh, well, either you speak about different things, then it's uh, complementary. Or you speak about the same thing, and then if you contradict each other, very interesting, let's discuss it, right? So be happy if you have a nice controversy here, which of the methods is the better one? So it's wonderful. So I, I don't see anything, so to speak, existentially than dangerous because of quanti uh, quantitative method. It's just the way of, of of having a good judgment what fits to what and how they are complementary. And this one has to find out. And there I cannot give you an answer because I don't know the details. If I analyze the details, well, I've, I've done that in several disciplines. When people ask me, saying, look, Paul, you're a philosopher with the philosophy of science background. Look at our controversy, what's going on. That happened to me, so in economics, for instance. And then it's interesting, but I have to know the details, and I have to talk to the relevant scientists, because then I learn the stuff. OK, thank you. I'm afraid we have to stop the discussion here. So uh, thank you, Paul, once again. And the thanks for the questions. Christine has some information for you. But first, let's, yeah.